The Tom Woods Show, episode 1641. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you're like me, when you criticize the Federal Reserve, you get all these lackey-style responses. Why the Fed has made the economy more stable. You don't want to go back to the 19th century, do you? All kinds of arguments like that. Well, you can blow those and others out of the water with my free ebook, Our Enemy, the Fed. Grab it at OurEnemyTheFed.com. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here, joined today by Georgia State Representative Matt Gertler who has an interesting story. He's a young pup of merely 31 years. So uh, he hasn't been around quite as long as the old man here. But man, he's putting the old man to shame with how active he is and and, uh, the hard work he's put in. And I want to talk to him about Georgia, his race there, some of the uh, issues that are on everybody's minds these days. And he comes highly recommended in particular from uh, Cliff Maloney from Young Americans for Liberty, whose judgment I trust completely and who's been a good friend over the years. Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Tom, for having me. I'm a big fan, so I really appreciate you having me on. I'm, I'm humbled. This is ridiculous that you were 18, barely able to vote back in 2007 when a lot of this got started with the Ron Paul campaigns. So I want to go into the distant past for you uh, beyond your tenure as a state representative and go back to when you were a much younger man and talk about what it was that attracted an 18-year-old to this, uh, you know, to this country doctor. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, Well, it's kind of an interesting story. I I did get involved young. My parents, uh, Paul and Kim, they've always been uh, lifelong Republicans. We were homeschooled, actually. I'm one of five siblings, um, so I come from a big family up here in Northeast Georgia. And I went to a, I went to the University of North North Georgia. Uh, it was formerly called uh, North Georgia College and State University. They changed the name, but it was a senior military school. Um, total immersion. They had, uh, you know, there's only six senior military schools in the nation, uh, next to West Point and Texas A&M and VMI and the Citadel and Annapolis and of course in GCSU, which is now University of North Georgia, but. My mom, Kim, uh, sent me an email uh, when I was in ROTC, and uh, it was it was a link to Ron Paul, and it said, "Is this guy for real?" And um, and he uh, he cured my apathy, as they say. And so I was just like, you know, what struck out me the most about Ron Paul was he was so consistent. And so I started looking into his, you know, who he was. And I was looking at YouTube uh, videos from you know past, way past when he was a. Uh, he was still the congressman, and he would just say the same things over and over and over again. And that consistency was what really, you know, brought me to him initially. And uh, and I've never uh, went back to sleep. My, my dad always says, you know, once you wake up, you can't go back to sleep. And that certainly was true for me. Uh, so basically, yeah, I got involved because of Ron Paul, and I was in military school, and it really woke me up. And one of the biggest issues that you know stuck out to me was not only his consistency, but he was a strict constitutionalist. And that, you know, what was happening when, to what my situation was, you know, in 2007, uh, you know, we were, were, were in Abra- Afghanistan, we were in Iraq. And, uh, and at the time when I was 18, it was more sort of catered toward uh, Iraq at the time. That's what we were all talking about. And we went through training and I stayed in ROTC for two years. But really what kept coming back to my mind was, you know, that we weren't declaring war anymore, that we weren't doing it constitutionally. And Article One, Section Eight, uh, was something that stuck out to me. And you know, I started reading the Federalist Papers and really started delving into um, history of the United States. And I ended up getting my BA in history, actually. And really, what stuck out to me was Federalist uh, Sixty-Eight when Alexander Hamilton um, he would he you know he put that in the Constitution. And well, and well, basically, the kings used to bypass Parliament all the time and go to you war unilaterally. And that was just um, it stuck out to me that, you know, if we're going to we're going to do this and it's just an important um, issue, we should do it constitutionally. And why are we declaring war? And um, so, you know, God led me in a different direction. And, and I became really involved in politics um, after that. And I campaigned for for Ron Paul and on campus in, in 2007. Then when he ran again, um, I was out there again and I graduated in 2012. And then, then I went to work uh, as a legislative aide, actually, 
um, to my state representative, who eventually I went and took his seat. Um, but I was down there for four years at Georgia State Capitol, and I got to see all the statism right um, in right, right before my own eyes, basically. And it was just uh, it was appalling that you know it was most of the bills that would come up when I was, I was about 22, 23 years old, and, and I ran for state rep when I was 26. But between that in that time. It was uh, just astounding to see that government was just growing and growing, and Republicans, they control everything. They controlled the House, the Senate, the executive, yet they were passing the largest tax increase in Georgia history. They were growing government left and right, you know, using the power of government to take taxpayers' monies and interfering in the free market through subsidies, all these different things. And it was just upsetting to me, um, the hypocrisy. In well, that. hold on, hold on. Let's let's go back. You're skipping over the major, one of the major parts of your story, which is how does a guy at that age get elected to the, uh, the state house? I mean, talk about that. Yeah. So I, I was, I was down there four years, like I said, and, um, and, it, you know, eventually I said, I'll, you know, I'll run one day. I didn't know when, um, but my, my predecessor, uh, Stephen Allison, he decided to retire and, um, and it sort of opened the seat up for us, open seat. And I said, you know, I think, you know, I, I talked to my family, I prayed, I'm a Christian and my faith is important to me. I want to make sure I'm right, making the right decision. And we said, well, this was the right decision. Let's do it. And at 26 years old, of course, I was the youngest candidate. There was a five-man primary. Um, I announced in February of 2016, and we had a primary in, in May. And um, so I, you know, I, I went hard on the campaign trail. We went to every business we could go to. We tried to get a message out of Liberty. And um and we ended up getting, uh, it was a hard fought battle, of course. The, the establishment in Georgia it was against me from day one. The Speaker of the House, the chairman uh, of the Republican side all donated against me to my opponent. And they, they had picked their establishment pick like they usually do. And we ended up getting in a runoff. Um, I got 35% of the vote and I knocked on about 8,000 doors. And this was in a rural district too. So it was very hard. My predecessor actually said, you know, you can you can go to all the businesses. There's four counties up here, but it's you know it's going to be impossible to go door to door. It's just too mountainous, and you know it's going to take too long. So we uh, we went to everything we could do, and we had a little bit of time left. And I said, let's go out there and knock on doors. Let's do this. And me and my campaign manager, who, who's running my congressional campaign now, um, he uh, we just knocked on uh, you know thousands of doors, got the vote out, got 35 percent of the uh, four four way primary, and. Um, and my closest competitor got 22%. And then they moved to the runoff. And then it got really nasty. The establishment really got behind this other guy. And we still secured the vote. We got 61% in the runoff. And we then we went to the state capitol. So it was a really great victory for us. And then, of course, I mean, you, I mean you're, you're involved in politics. You know, I, I knew it was bad at the state capitol as an aide. But when I got you know, elected when I was the representative elect, you know, we don't even have to worry about the uh, a Democrat in the November election. The Democrat usually never runs at all because it's such a Republican district. It's, a, it's the third most Republican district in the United States. Um, so very red rural district. And so we didn't even have competition in November. And the establishment, they, you know, they would take you to these nice dinners and they would try to influence you and, and different things. And, uh, and then when it came down to the voting, you know, of course, I upheld a really high standard to the Constitution. I became uh, sort of the litmus test, they would say, I guess. But I vote no a lot. And that's the reason why, you know, there's such strict criteria. When I look at legislation, you know, I always ask, you know, is it constitutional? It doesn't increase the size, the scope or the intrusiveness of government. Uh, and could I read it? <laughs> you'd, be you'd be surprised how many how many uh, bills they would push through to you. And they said you were just expected to vote for it, you know. And uh, so I earned that reputation. I voted about 40 percent no compared to about 99 percent of Republicans who vote yes to everything, along with the Democrats. Very astounding. But uh, but, yeah, I would come down as Mr. No or Dr. No, which I was sort of uh, honored by that because I know Ron Paul was was known as that as well. And, and then we had a couple articles written about us over the years that, you know, that this who is this guy the next Ron Paul. So I thought that was really awesome. And just trying to uphold a high standard um, to limited government principles, basically. Well, what and, do you attribute your success to? Do you think it was the fact that nobody tries to go door to door in a district like that? The fact that you did it just shocked people. It did. We still get, I still get emails and calls to this day, four years later, that um, say that uh, no one's ever came to my door. And I'll always remember you come to my door. 
I just thought it was it's the right thing to do. Um, we had we had the time to do it. It's what you should be doing. You should be talking to the voters. Um, I actually had a funny story. I had uh, during my first election, I, I went to somebody's house and I can't remember. It was in Tiger, but I can't remember the, who the lady's name was. But um, I went up to her. I was walking up to her and she said, stop right there. Look, you've called me personally. You, I've seen your radio ads. Or I mean, I've heard your radio ads. You came to my house twice now. You've got my vote. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, we're just trying to get our message out. And, uh, you know, really the message was bringing principles back into politics. You know, uh, don't trade values for votes um, ever. And, and having that consistency, that's what stuck with me with Ron Paul. But he was so consistent. And that's what I saw a lot of was lacking on the state level and on the federal level as well, that the, there's so much inconsistency. You know, you, you're, you're basically, you know, Voting for this one day, a tax increase and voting, you know, the other way I've heard limited government and then big government the next day. And there's there's no real consistency that I saw. And then people would sell out. So that was my message to the voters was, you know, I want to bring principles back into politics. And it, it resonated. Uh, you know, the message of liberty and principles and values um, really resonated with voters. And they, they've been behind me ever since. And um, I, yeah, I can also tell you about, you know, the, the leadership, you know, they. They don't like me very much. Uh, I've been a very, um, you know, troublesome to them, I guess you'd say, because, you know, I, I try to, to vote, you know, 100 percent liberty, you know, to the Constitution. You know, the best way that I know how, just to what the founders intended. And they, they tried everything in the book to get me out. And uh, they actually the first time in Georgia history during my reelection, uh, the Speaker of the House, the incumbent and then the, uh, the incumbent governor, who was who is our former governor now. He came up to my district and campaigned against me in my reelection uh, against the incumbent member of their own party. And we still got 60 percent, uh, which is amazing. And uh, now I'm running for Congress. Well, the fact that you made the establishment unhappy or uncomfortable, what has that looked like then as a state representative? What kind of relationship have you had with the party? Yeah, so it really started, you know, before I was even, um, when I was a candidate, they were donating against me. And then fast forward, when I was elected, they sort of they tried to take me under their wing, you know, and they said, you know, you're not going to be, a, there's these, these key words they always use, you know, um, you know, you want to be effective. That was one of the words used eight words all the time. Um, you got to get things done, you know, and uh, so I had uh, many meetings with the speaker and the chairman and, you um, they basically tried to influence me to vote um, their way onto a lot of issues that I could not support, uh, mostly with, you know, subsidies, interference in the free market. As a free market advocate, you know, we shouldn't be using taxpayer money whatsoever to pick winners and losers. Um, that was the gist of it. And so I, I respectfully told them, I, you know, I couldn't support anything like that. You know, I, I've been the only representative to vote against the budgets in here in Georgia um, for the last four years straight. They add about a billion to $1.5 billion of debt every year to Georgians, as well as hundreds of millions of dollars of subsidies. And so the leadership, you know, the relationship was very, um, at first it was sort of trying to influence me to go along with everything. And then it was, it, then it became sort of uh, pushing and then uh, physically pushing into corners, um, threats, uh, of taking funding from my district um, from bureaucrats. Uh, the governor's chief of staff actually threatened me in the governor's mansion my freshman year at a freshman breakfast in front of other representatives of freshmen um, to intimidate them into voting for the budgets because I had voted against a small budget they call it here in Georgia, which is about a $600 million carryover, which had all these different, you know, it's just an omnia style bill they put into it. And uh, a lot of things aren't the proper old government. So I voted against that budget, and then a big budget was coming up. This was about a $23 billion budget back in uh, 2017. And uh, he sort of, sort of wanted to and threaten me and tell me in front of the people that if, if I don't vote for the big budget, he was going to strip all funding to my district. <laughs> and it intimidated everybody else, and they all, they all you know, capitulated and they voted for the budget. And I, st I stood alone on that budget vote and voted no. And then after that, they sort of – um, it's sort of to, to know that I was not going to um, kowtow, that I wasn't going to break. And they could have left me alone a little bit and they, they knew where I stood and it got a lot easier. The fresh, my freshman year was probably the toughest year to stand on principle. And then after that, it got a lot easier and a lot easier. And then my reelection, like I said, that was a hard fought, a fought battle. And they, they came and did everything they could to get me out. They outspent me two to one. I think they spent over $100,000 in this election. And I had only raised about 50000 and uh, and we were successful. 
And so it was kind of it was kind of embarrassing for them when I came back into the caucus meeting after my election and uh, they had to work with me. And uh, they were just they were sort of like, you know, let's let's let bygones be bygone bygones. And I said, well, this is kind of liberating. You know, uh, we're in open warfare now before you were stabbing me in the back. Now you were stabbing me in the face. So this is this is actually liberating for me. And they emboldened me actually even more to speak up even more and to recruit people. And um, so I, I founded a sort of a conservative freedom caucus in 2018 after I was reelected. And those guys that I recruited, uh, they became the second and third most conservative members of the of the, of the House um, in Georgia here. And so, uh, you know, that's that's leading by example. I think that's the only way to change things is is you got to lead by example. I, I'm not going to tell anybody, you know, how to vote unless I can do it myself. But we earned a great reputation in that in the leadership. It's hard to work with with. Um, you know, I always tell you know my my colleagues that are on my side. You know, we have a small group of people, of course. You know, you can't trust untrustworthy people, and so they always sort of try to like undermine only um, undermine you all the time. And uh, I think they're happy. Just to, Tom, I think they're happy that I'm leaving the House to give up my House seat to run for Congress now. Um, but they're very upset that I'm running for Congress because it looks like we have a great chance of winning this race. So, to describe for me the contours of the race: who's in it? Um, well, who's in the seat now? Is it an empty seat? Give me the whole thing. Who's running? Which party has is likely to win? That sort of thing. Thank you. Uh, yes, it's an open seat. Uh, our congressman was Doug Collins. Doug Collins is running for U.S. Senate now in Georgia. So the seat became open uh, very unexpectedly um, back in February of this year. So we evaluated things. Um, I went up and uh, talked to my good friend Thomas Massey. Talked with Rand Paul. Um, they they have both endorsed our campaign. They're very they were encouraging. They were they were saying you know we've been watching you, um, and you know we we jumped into it. You don't know how things are going to go, of course, but we jumped in. Uh, there's nine candidates in the race right now. So it's typical sort of for open seats. You have everybody and their mom running against you, you know, uh, but there's only three elected officials. Um, I'm a state rep. There's a, another state rep. The establishment has gotten behind. And there's a state senator. Uh, there's a, some other candidates are non-viable. And then we have um, a former congressman to the area, which is uh, he was a congressman about, about 10 years ago. And there's sort of an independently wealthy guy that um, is going to dump a lot of money in to try to buy the election. But really, I see about maybe about four viable candidates. So what we're banking on is getting getting into the runoff. Uh, but three of those candidates um, out of the nine, only we have bases, you know, have a great base here. And the district that I represent, actually, I think that we had something to do with this, but they vote more than any other House district in, in Georgia. So we have the highest voter turnouts in primaries in my particular House district, uh, House District 8. Uh, but, you know, the election is June 9th. Um, we'll have they got pushed back, you know, because the, the coronavirus crisis we have going on. So May 19th was the election. Now it's June 9th uh, in Georgia. You have to have 50 percent of the vote plus one one vote um, not to not go to a runoff. So we predict that we will you know, no one will get into the um, you know, no one will get that that amount of votes, but we'll get close to that. And then those to, those to top two competitors We'll go to a runoff for eight weeks um, up in, uh, into August, actually. Um, so, so far, you know, we've been campaigning for about 60, uh, 66 days or so. We've got about 42 days left to go. So sort of a little short sprint here. Uh, very um, good support coming in, you know, from the liberty movement, from, you know, real patriots across the nation. We've been able to raise over $200,000 and uh, we actually raised more and then all the candidates combined with small donations. So we had about $32,000 of that was from donations that were less than $200. And my closest competitor got uh, $4,500 from small donations. And and we raised out, raised them by 20,000, somewhere in there, all the candidates combined, if you added up like that. So just a grassroots campaign. Uh, this time is a little different because we can't go door to door. Um, so, you know, we, we have a, um, we have a um, stay in, shelter in place order until about the 30th of this month, and then the emergency declaration will end uh, May 13th. So we might have some time to go door to door, but just not sure at this point, um, you know, how that will receive the public opinion. And of course, we want to be safe. Uh, but so far, it's going very good. I'm so happy to be on your show to let you guys and your listeners know what's going on. You know, this really is a grassroots movement. We have donors from 43 states or more at this point that have really gotten behind us. And, you know, Ron Paul people, Rand Paul people, Thomas Massey people, um, you know, Thomas Massey is a good friend of mine. I know him for the last three years through Young Americans for Liberty, and he's supporting me. They've endorsed me. Um, Freedom Works, they've gotten behind us. 
uh, Protect Freedom PAC, uh, just to, some great liberty loving people have gotten behind our campaign. And we're, we're really optimistic about getting to the runoff because I think if we get to the runoff, I think I can definitely secure this seat uh, because everything will be determined in the primary. You know, uh, we have three Democrats running in November, but this is a 70 30 district, you know, 70% Republican. So there's really no competition in the uh, general election. So, you know, I think all eyes are on, on this race right now. And I know there's a couple of people uh, also like Nick Friedis and Eric Brakey. They're more well, I'm catered toward the general election, but I'm hoping and praying that they get elected. And, you know, we can have a new a new squad up there. You know, Nick Friedis, Eric Brakey and, and Matt Gertler and uh, Thomas Massey. I think that would be amazing. Well, I can't help asking, even though it's an issue that as a U.S. congressman is not as urgent because it really is a local and state issue. But you are a state rep, so it's a legit question. What's been your personal response and as a legislator to the crisis right now with the virus? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I had this question come up in the debate on Saturday. I said, I think there's three things going on. Of course, you know, the health crisis, um, you know, you have the economic crisis and then what the proper role of government is. Um, just from my personal experience, you know, we should all consider and 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 take those those three thing those three things um, um, to heart for real. That, that they're really um, concerning to a lot of people, and you can be concerned about all three at one time. And so we had this um, this come up. Our session actually is in in suspension right now. We're not adjourned yet, actually. Um, so we'll go back on the, in on June 11th. Uh, but we actually had a special session. It's my second special session in four years. Very rare. Usually, you only have a special session every 10 years or so. And uh, we had a special session on March 16th uh, to give the governor, um, you know, our governor, Governor Kemp, um, unlimited power um, to the executive for an emergency uh, health crisis. And uh, it was, you know, I'll tell you the story is sort of uh, astounding when you see uh, on compromise, you know, when people compromise. We, we got to the session early at the Capitol, 8 o'clock in the morning. Usually we start at 10 o'clock, got there early, we had, and we didn't have anything on our desk. We didn't know what we were voting on. And... Um, about two hours later, they gave us two pieces of paper, and one was a 30-day renewal, and one was a uh, unlimited renewal to the executive. So this is basically Civics 101. You know, of course, we want to check the executive and their power. And so everybody that morning, every Democrat, every Republican said, we are not voting for the unlimited power, not at all. And there's going to be some reasonable response to this, um, this health crisis. So we'll, we'll do the 30-day renewal so that the governor will have to come back to the legislative branch and ask for more to his power to be extended, basically. And so we had passed out the 30-day renewal um, as a reasonable response. It went to the Senate, uh, it came back, and they had stripped all the language uh, back to their original um, bill, which said unlimited power. The governor had unlimited power. He can automatically renew our power um, in, in every 30 days without it without a check on the executive um, on the executive from the legislative branch. And uh, the same policy was there, so it didn't change. Uh, so fast forward three hours later, um, they come, it comes up to a, to a vote. And I had talked to Democrats, Republicans. They said they would not vote for the unlimited power. But when it came down to the vote, um, I stood alone again. <laughs> I stood alone again uh, based off the principle. It set a dangerous precedent. And every Republican and every Democrat in the House and the Senate all voted for it. And then the voters in Georgia got very upset with this. And so I've been hearing, you know, we're, we're actually one of the first states in the nation um, to open back up for business. We slowly started doing this last Friday. And by this Friday, I think we should be fully open. And then we'll have you know, our emergency declaration will end the 13th of May. And so we're trying to lead by that as well um, to you know, get back to work, of course, but have personal responsibility. You know, the Constitution um, doesn't get shredded up when we have a crisis. There wasn't an, act an actress uh, you know, in the Constitution that this is all null and void if uh, there's a pandemic. Um, and I think you understand that more than, than most people. So in your congressional campaign, how is the messaging different from when you ran as a state rep? Obviously, there were different issues at the federal level. So which ones are you emphasizing? Right. Um, well, you know, um, a lot of the, some, some of the similar for, for sure, you know, uh, bringing principles back into politics. You know, if you want a liberty candidate with a proven record, um, you know, I'm your guy. That that's one of the biggest things. You know, one of the biggest issues for us in this district is being such a conservative district. Um, they want real conservatives. You know, the Second Amendment's a really big issue here. Of course, re religious freedom also a really big issue, and the issue of life. Um, you know, the, the anti-abortion issue. You know, we I co-sponsored the heartbeat bill 
uh, which is we're very happy that it passed uh, one of the most pro-life pieces of legislation to pass in the nation um, last year. So the issue of life, you know, that's a, it's a huge issue up here in the rural mountains. Um, you know, the Second Amendment, of course, you know, small government principles and, and, and really, you know, the constitutional principles. When I talk about the Constitution, the mission of liberty, uh, it resonates with people. I think people understand and want to be free and understand that their rights, you know, are derived, derived from God and, and governments here just to, just to, you know, guarantee those rights. And so those things really resonate. You know, I'm so fortunate to be a candidate in such a great district um, here in Northeast Georgia where my message uh, is, is just taken so well. And so those are the types of things we're getting a lot of support from people. Uh, and being a younger candidate as well, you know, I'm 31. Um, people really want, you know, principled leadership that is young. And um, in, at 31, I'm not the, you know, I'm the youngest candidate for sure, but that's been resonating a lot with people around here. And it, when I first ran for state rep at 26, you know, I had a mentor come to me and say, you know, what is your greatest weaknesses and your strengths? And but he asked me my greatest weakness first, and I said, well, it's probably my age. You know, I don't think these people are going to respect me. Uh, they're not going to think that I have experience, even though I had worked as a legislative aide for four years. That's going to be a hurdle to get over because everybody I was running against was. You know, they were 20 and 30 years older than me or more, and uh, they have more life experience. Um, but, you know, they actually going door to door and talking to the voters over the course of those months in 2016 and running, uh, it became my greatest asset. Um, people, you know, loved our message, of course, but they liked that they had, you know, a young conservative, you know, liberty minded conservative that knew what he was talking about. And um, so so those are some of the issues that were, were, um, were taking the message to the voters um, this last, you know, 60 days. And. Just a little bit more to go, you know, 43, 42 days to go, actually. So short little sprint here. In uh, talking to people, now again, obviously you're restricted right now and talking to people face to face, but what is the impression you get about where people stand on the lockdown thing? Because, I mean, I know it's not strictly a lockdown in some places, but we all know what we mean, the stay-at-home orders and stuff like that. Because the, the opinion polls seem to suggest that almost everybody in California is really excited about the governor and they think he's doing the right thing. I mean, over 80% think mm -hmm. that. So what's the difference, if any, in the people you're talking to? It's about 50, 50. Um, you know, that's what I get. Uh, half the people that I talk to, I get a lot of correspondence from constituents. Um, just over the past few years being a state rep, I'm very accessible. I have my own personal cell phone number and I explain all my votes. So people are in tune and, you know, I'm attacked more than any other legislator. Um, so I sort of an, a reputation, you know, for standing on principle. So people contact me a lot. And so I get phone calls and texts. But I would say just based off my personal experience with through emails and phone calls and text messages from voters, it's about 50 50. Um, you know, they want to go back to work. Half of them do. And half of them, you know, uh, want to be safe and stay home, which is understandable. And, um, you know, really the big issue is, you know, what the proper role of government is and, you know, what. Also, you know, with the economy, um, how long can this go on and, and what is the effects that it's going to happen um, to our nation as well? So, you know, when when Brian Kemp, our governor, you know, announced uh, really early more than any other governor was saying, you know, we're going to uh, go back to work, start this back to work. There were there were some hostile, um, you know, comments to it. Um, There's some concern to it. Um, but, you know, half the other people were saying, you know, this is good. We, we need to get back to work. You know, let's promote personal responsibility. You know, just let's be safe, you know, wear your mask. Um, you know, if we can go to the grocery store, you know, I can go and open up my my uh, my store down the road, too, as well. And um, so it's about 50 50. That, that's that's based on my personal experience. OK, now, given that, again, the sort of campaigning that would normally go on seems to be suspended under the circumstances. How are, are you guys sniping at each other in the press or on social media or how is the campaigning actually taking place between you and the other candidates? Yeah, so it's been interesting running a campaign during the pandemic, for sure. Yeah. So I mean, for example, Joe Biden has it has disappeared. He's invisible. Yeah, yeah. It uh, it, it was something we never expected to happen, for sure. Um, so what we were focusing on a lot is phone banking. Of course, um, we made yeah. the thousands of phone calls. Um, you know, I'm always reaching out to voters. Uh, social media, we're amping that up uh, tremendously more than we would have um, traditionally. Um, you know, putting our mailers out there. You know, one thing you can't do is, you know, you can't look the voter in the eye and shake their hand. I, I really um, am upset. I'm upset about that. I really love campaigning and, you know, meeting the people. We've had online debates. Uh, been very interesting. 
Um, so we've had a couple online debates. We'll have a couple more. We're hoping we can get, you know, back out and, you know, door knock and have some meet and greets and some real live debates um, in front of the voters, uh, maybe the end of May, I'm hoping. Uh, we hope that happens maybe mid-May. And so it, we just have to adapt and overcome and uh, get our message out as much as possible and, you know, uh, and try to do everything we can to, to reach the voter. Uh, because if, if you can't look them in the eye and you can't really meet them one-on-one, um, this is going to be a very interesting uh, election. And, you know, I think if, if I get into the runoff and I can win this thing, uh, I could probably win uh, most any election <laughs> because uh, the pandemic uh, really has just made it interesting. But we're doing everything we can uh, besides the things you can't, I guess you'd say, which is, uh, you know, face to face, you know, meet and greets. Like I said, those those real live debates in front of the voters and uh, and door knocking. So those are three things you really can't do. Um, so we're just amping up everything else and trying to put that over the top so we can get our message out. And so far, like I said, it is uh, support's coming in um, from all over the place. There's 20 counties in this district, very big rural counties. And we have, uh, I've been representing about four of those counties. And so I think we, like I said, we're really optimistic about the future and just got to get through, um, you know, to the, to the runoff, you know, if we get to the runoff, I think it can beat any one of my competitors, the guys I'm running against on the elected official side, very, very bad voting records. They've supported all the, the bloated budgets and added to debt and, uh, and subsidies and, and approved of all those things. Omnius style budget bills, much like DT, DC does, and something I've been fighting, you know, as a fiscal hawk, been fighting against uh, these Omnius style bills and have introduced my own bills in the state house, uh, House Bill 4, which breaks down the, the, the budget by department, which is really common sense. I got bipartisan support for it. And so that we would be able to vote by department, each one of the departments, 49 separate departments in Georgia. But at this point, they put all those departments in one bill and they say, you got to vote for it. And if you don't, uh, you don't support, you know, uh, education and you don't support law enforcement and everything under the book. You know, you hate kids and you hate puppies and <laughs> something they attack me for, uh, you know, voting against the budgets uh, every year. And so uh, this is one of those things where we just got to keep getting our message out. And letting the people know that, like, that we are the we are the true liberty warrior that is proven record, and that's that's one of the biggest things we're running our campaign on. Well, glad to hear. It. What's your website? My website's uh, mattgertler.com. Uh, it's m a t t g u r t l e r, and that'll redirect you to mattgertlerforcongress.com. Uh, we'd love everybody's support. I know your listeners uh, out there. Um, you have some great liberty loving listeners. Uh, please check me out. Check out my record. Um, go to a website, call me on my cell phone, it's my personal cell phone number, 706-490-2285. Uh, you can reach me there at matt at mattgertler.com. That's my email. You know, uh, please reach out to me. I'd love to hear from people, you know, uh, around the state, around the country. Uh, we definitely need your help. And uh, I can't wait to get up there and serve beside Thomas Massey and, um, you know, be another, you know, uh, advocate for limited government and really the conservative liberty message that we want to get back to the constitution. And so, uh, yeah, we, I just thank you so much, you know, for, for allowing me to come on your show and, and, you know, talk about our campaign. Well, my pleasure. And, uh, I'll put the website you just mentioned at, uh, tomwoods.com slash 1641, the show notes page for today. Well, good luck, Matt. Thanks for the conversation. No, absolutely. Tom, thank you so much. And, and God bless you. All right, folks, that's our episode for today. If you're still, Stuck at home, you got all these free ebooks of mine you could be reading. Cost you nothing, and you could be sitting there reading. Let me think of a good one. What's a good one? Oh, why not? Why not the healthcare one, given the circumstances? Your Facebook friends are wrong about healthcare. Go get that one. That's a good one. It's over at yourfriendsarewrong.com. So go get that, read that, report back tomorrow. See you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.